dear faculty, staff, students, friends, and the distinguished guests, welcome to attend the opening ceremony of the symposium entitled Jiangnan Buddhist Traditions in Context, the Early Modern Period, organized and hosted by the Center for Buddhist Studies at the College of Humanities, the University of Arizona. My name is Jiang Wu, Director of Center for Buddhist Studies, the host and the co-organizer of this symposium. On behalf of the center's staff, faculty, I would like to welcome you to join this online symposium on Jiangnan Buddhist traditions in early modern context at the end of this semester. This event has been funded through Lingyin and the Puyin Buddhist Studies Lecture Series, and we thank our donors and the collaborators for their generous support. I also want to thank the symposium co-organizer, Dr. Jennifer Eichmann, for putting the program together, and also our center's staff member, Jeffrey Liu, Jacqueline Laird, and the Morel Coast, and our College of Humanities Dean's Office financial team for their administrative support. At the end of the year 2021, I would like to send you an early holiday greeting and wish you a prosperous new year. It has been another difficult year for all of us. We have had to endure all kinds of inconvenience and health risks caused by the pandemic both physically and mentally. However, our perseverance and the resilience has become even stronger. This symposium is an example of our efforts to provide new opportunities through online interactions. We hope to create a wonderful online conference experience for all of you. The Center for Buddhist Studies was established in 2017 with a generous seed donation from Dr. Su Wukang and the financial and administrative support from the College of Humanities. The center is a research, educational, and outreach center and it collaborates with departments and the communities within and outside the University of Arizona to promote academic research on the Buddhist tradition and its related religious, intellectual, social, cultural, and artistic aspects in all geographical regions in the world. Every year, the center initiates activities and programs, including Buddhist studies, lecture series, academic conferences, workshops, academic publications, digital scholarships, training and education in related fields visiting scholar program, contemplative studies, community outreach, and the financial assistance to scholars and the students of Buddhist studies. The center also engages in the preservation of a Buddhist heritage in its textual and artistic forms, and in cutting edge research on all aspects and the traditions of a Buddhism in the world. In the past year, uh, actually in this year, right? Our Kinsei, Puyin, and the Lingyin lecture series continued, and our fellowship programs were carried out without interruption. Awards have been given to talented students who have engaged in high quality research. Some have already finished their dissertations successfully despite the pandemic. Our faculty also conducted amazing research and maintained their high productivity as usual. I can't help mentioning our exciting building project together with the Andrew Well Center for Integrated Medicine, which is at the end of the design stage and will start building very soon. In the new year, we have lined up several exciting events and I would like to make a few announcements here. First, 2022 is the 350th death anniversary of the Chinese Zen master Yin Yuan, or in Japanese, Ingen, who founded the Japanese Obaku tradition. We plan to make him the theme of our 
events during the coming year to celebrate his life and accomplishment in both China and Japan. An online exhibition of Obaku art will be launched in March. A series of lectures by scholars and specialists will introduce him and his tradition to the public. In addition, a music concert featuring the Japanese Zen monk musician, Mr. Kongho Yakushiji, will be premiered online in October. Tea ceremony demonstrations will also be presented in association with these events. In addition, in the new year, our center is going to host 2022 Pacific Neighborhood Consortium annual meeting together with Academia Seneca in Taiwan in mid-September. Pacific Neighborhood Consortium, uh, also called PNC, is one of the leading organizations in the fields of digital humanities, informatics, and e-learning. We are honored to host this three-day event on the campus of the University of Arizona. In this opening ceremony, we would like to invite a few distinguished guests to speak to us and kick off this event. First, we have our College of Humanities Associate Dean Ken McAllister to speak on behalf of our college. Second, Venerable Guangquan, Abbot of Lingyin Temple in Hangzhou, will speak through a pre recorded video with subtitles on behalf of our sponsors in China. Third, we would like to invite Dr. Albert Walter to speak on behalf of our co-sponsor, Department of East Asian Studies. Then Dr. Jennifer Eichmann will speak on behalf of the symposium organizers. At the last, if time allows, I will introduce our panelists and the distinguished guests briefly. We will conclude this opening ceremony with a photo session. Without further ado, let me introduce our first speaker. Professor Ken McLeister specializes in digital humanities, rhetorics of technology and computer game studies. He has authored or co-authored six books, three edited collections, and dozens of articles and book chapters on media history, theory, and analysis. He is the co-director of the Learning Games Initiative Research Archive. He is also a faculty member at the Department of Public and Applied Humanities, and also Associate Dean of Research and Program Innovation in the College of Humanities. So now please welcome uh, Ken McLister to speak for us. So Ken, please. Thank you, John. Really appreciate that introduction. And good afternoon and welcome, friends and colleagues. Um, as John said, uh, my name is Ken McAllister. I'm the Associate Dean for Research here in the College of Humanities. Um, Alain Philippe Durand, the Dorrance Dean uh, of the College of Humanities, sends his warm regards. His travel schedule uh, and this event unfortunately didn't mesh, but he did want me to share with you all his hope that your time together for the next few days is thought provoking and inspires new ideas, projects, and collaborations. Uh, Dr. Wu asked me to spend just a few minutes to give you all a bit of institutional context for this important meeting. For the last 10 years, the East Asian Studies Department here at the University of Arizona has been systematically building its reputation as a leading hub for, among other things, the study of Chinese languages, histories, and cultures. From the hiring of rising star faculty to the advancement of unparalleled projects like the Spatial Analysis of Religion Lab and the Hangzhou VR project, to the creation of the Center for Buddhist Studies, the East Asian Studies Department has become one of our college's most imaginative and intellectually rigorous units. In the last five years, for instance, their modestly sized faculty have produced an astonishing 586 pieces of scholarship, including more than 20 books and hundreds of refereed articles and chapters. 
Professor Albert Welter, who's here today, um, and that is that department's ever entrepreneurial leader. Uh, and he has been instrumental to these successes. And I just wanna say thank you, Professor Welter, for all that you've done over the years that have enabled us to gather together here today. The primary organizational engine uh, driving much of this important work has been the Center for Buddhist Studies. As engines go, I think it's fair to say that through brilliant institutional tactics, creative energy and unflagging tenacity, the engine that the center's founding director, Professor Zhang Wu has created is a rocket engine. From its modest beginning several years ago, the Center for Buddhist Studies is now a fixture on campus and in the Tucson community. Increasingly, it is the go-to resource and research partner for the most cutting edge approaches to understanding the endlessly transformative roles that Buddhism has had on everything from personal health care to global politics. Vital to the center's many accomplishments have been the strong relationships it's formed with its partners. Distinguished and lively collaborations with Lingying Temple, the Puyin Education Center, and the Kienzi Foundation, for instance, have resulted in, as you've heard, a record-setting lecture series scholarships for a brilliant cadre of students, the launch of two influential newsletters, the Chinese Buddhist Canon uh, Research Newsletter and the Community Wellness Newsletter, and the receipt of the honor of hosting next year's prestigious uh, Pacific Neighborhood Consortium. Given this sustained level of energy, it's no surprise that as Jung mentioned, uh, the famed proponent of integrative medicine, Dr. Andrew Weil, has selected the Center for Buddhist Studies to locate its facilities in the stunning new Andrew Weil Center for Integrative Medicine here on the University of Arizona campus. As impressive as all of these details are, remember, this is just a curated sample of the centers and of East Asian, the East Asian Studies Department's accomplishments. There are many, many more, including in areas related to Japan studies, Korean studies, and Tibetan studies. As the Dean, mainly responsible for supporting our college's research enterprise, when I reflect on all that my colleagues in the East Asian Studies Department and the Center for Buddhist Studies, uh, including faculty, staff, and students, when I reflect on all that they've accomplished and are accomplishing, I'm reminded of words contained in the 1963 report that ultimately led to the creation of the National Endowment for the Humanities. Uh, in 1963, President Kennedy, uh, responding to the phenomenal innovations born of the creation of the National Science Foundation, called for a, the creation of a companion organization. In the resulting presidential proposal, the authors described the work of the humanities like this. By awakening a sense of what it might be like to be someone else or to live in another time or culture, the humanities tell us about ourselves. They stretch our imagination and enrich our experience. The goal of the humanities, they said, is not to generalize, but to illuminate. Experience, not generalization, is what humanities have to offer human understanding. Not the scientific exploration of things, not the scientific examination of the behavior of groups of people, but the living, vivid acquaintance with the adventure, with the adventures of the human spirit. This is the provenance and the province of the humanities. Uh, beginning this afternoon, you will have the great good fortune to undertake just such work with engaged and diverse colleagues from around the world here at the Jungnan Buddhist Traditions in Context Conference. You'll have the opportunity to ask in the context of those traditions, early modern instantiations, what does it mean to seek 
a living, vivid acquaintance with the adventures of the human spirit? Answers to this question, of course, are the legacy of the pan-spatial, pan-temporal humanities and are at the core of our mission here in the College of Humanities. So thank you for your work toward this great end. On behalf of the entire College of Humanities, I bid you imagination, clarity of mind, and an openness of heart as you independently and collectively pursue this and related questions over the coming days. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken, for your nice words. Uh, we cannot thank more uh, for your help, your support, and uh, uh, the support we received from the College of Humanities. And we thank our Dean, uh, Alan Felipe Duran, as well, although he cannot join us, but uh, we appreciate uh, his uh, good wish. And I hope in the next few days, uh, all the panelists, our research can meet your expectation. Thank you very much. Okay, so next I want to uh, shift to a, a next speaker uh, who is our distinguished uh, guest, uh, Venerable Guangquan. Although Venerable Guangquan cannot join us in person uh, or online uh, virtually, but he sent this uh, video clip and uh, uh, it provides a very nice annotation about what Jiangnan means. So the Jiangnan Buddhist tradition appears in our title and for those who don't know what it is, Dr. Uh, I mean, Venerable Guangquan provided a very nice introduction. Right? Before I do that, share my screen, share this video. I want to introduce uh, Master Guangquan uh, just very briefly. Uh, Venerable Guangquan was born in 1961. He is a native of Hangzhou City. He graduated from Zhejiang University's Chinese Philosophy graduate program. In December 1989, he became a monk at the Fu Fa Guang Temple in Hainan County, Jiangsu Province. In April 1990, he was ordained at the Longhua Temple in Shanghai. In April 1992, he graduated from Shanghai Buddhist College, and from April to August of the same year, he studied at the Jiuhua Mountain Chinese Buddhist College. He has been the abbot of Chongming Guangfu Temple in Shanghai, the supervisor of Hangzhou Central Buddhist College, president of Hangzhou Buddhist College, executive director and the secretary general of the Zhejiang Buddhist Association, president of Hangzhou Buddhist Association. He's currently the abbot of Lingyin Temple in Hangzhou since uh, 2007 and the executive director of the Buddhist Association of China, the vice president of the Buddhist Association of Zhejiang Province. Okay, without further delay, let me share my screen and uh, we're going to watch this uh, video together.尊敬的各位专家学者人文荟萃历史的脉络 
，它既代表着地理、经济和方言的概念，又具备着丰富的文化内涵，作为社会文化、经济变革的重要区域，江南为佛教发展。交出了坚实的基础，而佛教呢，也深刻的影响着江南文化的结构和精神的特质。自从之前在东湖译经曲，佛教便开始扎根江南。南北朝时期出现“南朝四百八十寺，多少楼台烟雨”中的盛况。隋唐以降，随着全国经济重心的南移，江南佛教也成为了中国佛教的重中之重。开放的佛教也让鉴真等高僧从江南走出了国门，东渡日本，弘扬佛法。杭州历来是江南文化的名城，也是我国。著名的东南佛国所在地，早在五代时期，吴越王遣留列国杭州，御制东南，以保景安民的信佛顺天为国策。历代君王广建佛寺，扶持佛教，使得江南佛教一度繁盛。入宋以来，以灵隐、净山、天竺等为代表的五善十刹，成为宋时江南禅林的典范。此时，江南佛教盛况不衰，法门龙象辈出，被雍正皇帝誉为正代第一导师的有名延寿大师。大力倡导注宗融合，高标万善同归，曾受到吴越国忠义王之请，主持复兴灵隐寺，编撰了闻名于后世的佛学巨著《中经录》，开创了中国佛教禅净融会的新局面。一代宗师，大会中高禅师。创立了著名的看化禅，他奉召主持进山能忍禅院，中门弘扬江南的佛教。虽然经历排佛世界以及西方传教士的竞争，对他仍然独树一帜，保存着浓厚的佛教信仰。明代四大高僧之一的。莲池大师常住杭州云溪寺，是之成为久负盛名的净土道场。同时，《西游记》《济公全传》等经典的流通，也让佛教走向新的传播路径。中国近代佛教复兴，是继晚明佛教复兴之后的又一次复兴。当时，在江南地区形成了三顾佛教复兴的重要力量，其中以居士为代表的南京佛教，以僧人为主的杭州佛教，以及兼具僧俗两界的上海佛教，都为中国近代佛教复兴做出了重要的贡献。一大批诸有成效。和贡献的高僧与居士，如太虚大师、印光大师、地仙法师、虚云老和尚、弘一法师、元英法师，以及张太炎、范古农、吴碧华、马一佛居士等，也与杭州结下了深厚的缘分。杭州是太虚大师开展佛教改革运动和从事佛学著述的重要基地之一。一九一九年，他在杭州净凡寺创办了近代佛教最有影响的开悟
就是海潮音。一九二一年，出任杭州南山名刹净慈寺的主持，并实施了其整理僧协制度的改革计划。一九二七年，在灵隐寺潜心著述《真现实论》等重要著作，阐述其影响深远的人生佛教思想。中信南山律宗的弘一法师与杭州虎袍定慧寺出家，在灵隐寺受戒，玉泉寺研究律学，昭贤寺整理华严书钞，与弟子丰之凯居士编著《护生画集》，晚年还专门写了《我在杭州西湖出家之》。经过天台宗第四十三祖地贤法师，曾应邀到杭州六通寺开讲《法华经》，关心梵天寺祖庭的复兴。一九三零年，派其法师摩成在梵天寺举办天台宗佛学院，培养了一批生才。一九三四年四月二十八日，九世班禅与灵隐寺开十轮金刚法会，参加人数约七万多人，并作法语开示，讲了佛教育总理的平等观等。净土宗十三祖的印光大师曾多次来函弘法，为弥陀寺确定。念佛规制，维护修复净土宗十一祖沈安大师道场、梵天寺，杭州佛教界的高僧大德为近代佛学的入世转向做出了卓越的贡献，江南佛教也再次成为影响时代思潮的巨流。我们不禁可以在江南传统文献的汇编整理中。探索新的圈舍，还能对江南的区域研究中，捕捉经济社会与文化交织的脉络。当下，探索佛教传统如何融入江南地区的社会和经济结构，需要历史学、宗教学、社会学和民俗学等多元的知识储备。构建出合理的文化理论和解释框架。唐人提咏灵隐寺有一句名言：“楼观沧海日，门对浙江草。”江南佛教的传统与历史的脉络，会在今天激荡出怎样的新知？希望与会各位专家学者们深入研究。专门探讨，期待此次论坛的学术成果能有如此的气魄、格局，更期待各位与会专家学者能够在学术人生中藏宝如此的眼界、胸襟，帮助推动江南佛教的发展，并取得更多的成果。最后。衷心祝愿本次研讨会注释圆满，与会大众六世吉祥，身心康泰。阿弥陀佛。Okay, uh, so that's uh, Venerable Guangquan's uh, recorded speech. Uh, we want to thank. Master Guangquan for this wonderful introduction about Jiangnan Buddhism, and it's a very uh, nice overview, and uh, we like it very much. I think we benefit a lot, and we hope to meet uh, his expectation as well. Right? Uh, so now let me turn to our third speaker for today, uh, who is our uh, El Dr. Albert Walter. Let me introduce him. Just briefly, uh, Professor Albert Walter is currently Department Head of East Asian Studies at the University of Arizona. 
His research focuses on the study of Chinese Buddhism, particularly on the transition from the Lei Tang uh, about 9th century to the Song Dynasty, 10 to 13th centuries. He published widely and is leading the Hangzhou Region Buddhist Cultural Project, supported by the Kinsei Foundation in conjunction with Zhejiang University, the Hangzhou Academy of Social Sciences, and also the Hangzhou Buddhist Academy. His monograph, The Tale of Two Stupas, History of Hangzhou Relic Veneration through two of its most enduring monuments is currently in press from the Oxford University Press. Another volume, The Future of China's Past, Reflections on the Meaning of China's Rise is under review. I believe it must be in press as well. Uh, but anyway, without further ado, uh, let's welcome Dr. Albert Walter and uh, Albert, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zhang. Um, I guess my, my remarks compared with my the previous speakers are going to be a bit more unscripted. <laughs> um, anyway, I really appreciate um, the remarks that, that I made. And in, in fact, uh, um, much of my thunder was stolen. Some may uh, even accuse me that I paid Ken McAllister for those remarks, but in fact, I did not, <laughs> but they are greatly appreciated. But let me take the opportunity to kind of throw them back a little bit, which I'm very happy to do and do on every occasion like this when I have the opportunity that the success, any success that uh, the Department of East Asian Studies has had is, uh, has been generated through the support of the administration and particularly the College of Humanities at the University of Arizona. You know, I've, I've served in administrative capacities at other universities and I have not had the kind of support um, um, and encouragements that I have had here at the University of Arizona. And I can say that it, it has made uh, all the difference. But, um, and I would have to follow up and say, it was so nostalgic to see uh, Master Guangchuan, who I haven't seen because of the pandemic for a couple of years now. And I, I welcome the opportunity to, to see him in person sometime again soon. Um, so I'd like to welcome uh, on behalf of East Asian Studies, everybody to the event. Um, I'm uh, a little, I'm sorry that we can't be here in person. Um, Tucson, Arizona is a lovely place this time of year uh, with um, um, enjoyable temperatures. Um, I often uh, joke to um, people um, about the weather in Arizona that we have three seasons, high summer, midsummer, and low summer. So, uh, and, and actually high summer is what you want to avoid. Midsummer and low summer are okay. And we're, we're in kind of in entering low summer phase, but it's still, uh, it's quite nice. Anyway, I hope that we will be able to uh, welcome you here um, sometime in the future um, uh, in person. Uh, I think that would be a, a wonderful and I would look forward to that opportunity. You know, I also wanna thank the organizers for this event, uh, particularly Professor Zhang Wu and Jennifer Eichmann, um, wonderful job in putting this together. And the graduate students in East Asian Studies and um, uh, staff in the School of International Languages, Literatures and Cultures and the College of Humanities. Um, you know, the, the, the people that put these things together um, um, uh, are often, of course, we, we always thank them, but we don't um, appreciate fully what they've done is because they've created this context for um, for what we can do and what we will do, we, kind of opportunities and um, kind of a scholarly research and scholarly pro productivity are the result of the, the efforts, the, the oftentimes unseen efforts of, of so many people. So I think it really bears in thanking them. You know, I just wanna kind of follow up a little bit about uh, East Asian studies I mean, I, I, I've got an audience here, which I, you know, I really believe that I'm preaching to the choir, but, um, you know, um, the study of Asia and East Asian cultures and languages and cultures in particular, um, we have, a, we have a, a lot 
to, to contribute uh, to the humanities as a whole and to the cultures of the world as a whole. And um, you know, throughout the course of, of my career, I can see how it has, um, you know, it went from a, a you know very slim root, and it's how it's how it's blossoming. We still have a long, long way to go, but this is important, um, you know, in terms of the when I think about the university curriculums uh, of the present and the future, and I and I think of what we have continue to offer. I think that um, you know what we're doing in conferences like these. Again, we we have to we have to see the bigger picture. Sometimes, a lot of times, we're all rooted in our own particular research and studies, and and um, we also need to be cognizant of the fact of what we are really contributing to. And it's a it's a major shift, I would say, in the appreciation of the humanities. Um, um, you know throughout the world and, and the shift in the humanities. So I want us to really, um, you know, acknowledge that and take credit for what we have been doing and what we what we continue to do. Um, the um, Hangzhou um, Culture Project, let me say a few words about that. Um, you know, it, 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 it's really the, about the regional studies of Buddhism. And, you know, um, I think that we are maybe one of the first places that has really kind of tried to capitalize on the regional studies of Buddhism, not looking at Buddhism um, as a uh, kind of in terms of its larger, you know, context of East Asia as a whole, or even in terms of its national context, be it China, and focus on uh, on um, on a particular region. Now, uh, I'm not saying that Hangzhou is is the only imp important region in in the Chinese context, but I am saying that the Hangzhou and Jiangnan, by extension, is an important region. And I don't think anyone would would quibble with that. If we imagine Jiangnan as the as a center for example, with Hangzhou as its capital, and think of the radiating lines that, that go out, uh, you know, northwards toward Beijing, maybe towards Xi'an and Dunhuang, and then if we go over to Sichuan or to Yunnan and uh, maybe to Fujian or, and um, Taiwan, and not to mention, uh, of course, and something that I'm particularly interested in is how it radiates out across uh, the East China Sea towards Japan and Korea. And we think of the linkages uh, and, and Hong, Hangzhou and Jiangnan being as the center or an impetus for the creation of a, you know, in some, in some sense, starting with the Song Dynasty, kind of a post Tang Buddhist world and Buddhist culture. I think it's quite immense. And also I'm reminded here of, um, you know, uh, Lewis Lancaster has uh, promoted this idea. You know, for a long time, we've looked at the, the linkages in the Buddhist world. We look at, we've looked at it in terms of the overland route, the, the so-called Silk Road. And actually uh, Lewis Lancaster has pointed out that it's really the, the maritime route is actually more important. And when we look at that, then we start to see places like Hangzhou and Jiangnan, which are, uh, you know, a key feature of that maritime route, uh, and how the dissemination of Buddhism happening through this um, uh, uh, maritime uh, distribution, um, how how important it is, and of course, you know, I'm reminded too of, um, you know. Um, for example, uh, the connections even between uh, Sri Lanka and, and Hangzhou as a result of the maritime connect, uh, connection, um, even, even within my own work. Um, so let me, you know, you know what, what this conference does is it kind of brings together uh, um, and something that's quite uh, maybe Maybe not new for the participants, but new for uh, kind of the the uh, the rest of the 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 world, and and even to some extent the rest of the world, the Buddhist world brings together this intersection between um, Jiangnan and and the Ming Ming Dynasty, and um, and of course. Um, um, 
you know, uh, most people, if they think of Jiangnan and much of the research, including my own, has focused on the Song Dynasty and earlier periods. And of course, um, for good reason, Hangzhou became the capital during the Southern Song. So it, uh, it received a lot of emphasis here. But I think what this conference is, is will show uh, undoubtedly is that the importance um, goes far beyond um, the, the Song Dynasty and that the interest and importance of, um, of Jiangnan in periods beyond the Song Dynasty are, are, are not only relevant, but important for us to, us to consider. So um, I guess, um, I think that's pretty much all that I would like to say. And again, I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you all for being here. And I look forward to all the, the things that I'm going to learn uh, throughout the next few days. Thank you. Thank you, Albert. Thank you very much. We really appreciate your leadership throughout the years, uh, leading Department of the East Asian Studies to uh, such a wonderful uh, institution. And the next, I want to introduce uh, Dr. Jennifer Eichmann. Uh, Dr. Jennifer Eichmann uh, is research associate at the SOAS, Center for Buddhist Studies, University of London, uh, PhD from Princeton University. Her primary uh, research area is late Ming Dynasty Chinese Buddhist traditions. In light of her theoretical interest in the relationship between network and discourse, she is currently working on two book projects one on the life of the nun Zhu Jin, uh, this is the wife of Zhu Hong, and the other on the life of the second generation Wang Yangming Confucian leader, Wang Ji. Uh, without further ado, uh, now please welcome Dr. Jennifer Eichmann. Hello, everyone. Let me too extend a warm welcome to all of our participants and our audience. This is the first symposium co-organized by myself and Dr. Wu. Given that the University of Arizona Center for Buddhist Studies will be organizing other symposiums, workshops, and conferences in the near future, I thought I would say a few words about our collaboration. When Dr. Wu first approached me to see if I might be interested in organizing this symposium, I did have a few concerns. After all, many female scholars in our field worry that they are brought on as the token female face but that they will be doing all the administrative work. Well, I'm very happy and gratified to report that this symposium includes my vision, my ideas, my writing, and my invitations to scholars. It functioned truly as a joint project, and it included Dr. Wu's ideas too. For those of you who are thinking of organizing symposiums in the future, I want you to know that Dr. Wu was very easy to work with, and the process was quite streamlined. Whatever differences we had in vision or ideas, and I do believe it really help, is helpful to have differences and to be able to talk those things through, we worked all those ideas out in a couple of meetings in a congenial atmosphere. I felt Dr. Wu is very open to my suggestions and also very pragmatic in terms of implementation. In other words, I see a very bright future here for the kinds of intellectual work that can be done through the Center for Buddhist Studies. I do want to add that because so many scholars enthusiastically accepted our early invitations, we did not have an open call for papers. If you are in the audience and are presenting during this symposium, please rest assured that we would love to have you present in the next one. Please join the round table at the end of the symposium and offer your suggestions for types of gatherings on Zoom or in person that you would like to see and the topics you would like covered in future forums. We plan to take all suggestions seriously and the kind of synergy that can come through those kinds of discussions could lead to some new and interesting collaborations. Before I turn the mic back over to Dr. Wu, let me also add that we can only hope the technology will work as smoothly for the symposium as we have worked with each other. Given the length of the pandemic, we're all veterans of Zoom. We will mute the audience until after the presentations and then ask you to unmute yourself to ask questions. There should be a question hand emoji, hand emoji, the chair should be able to shift duties to presenters. We have technical support staff and a graduate student, Jeffrey Leo, who will be working 
behind the scenes to make sure everything runs smoothly. Once again, thank you for participating in what I'm sure will be a wonderfully intellectually stimulating symposium. And now I turn the mic back over to Dr. Wu. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. It's our pleasure to have you here and help us to organize the program. And you're the true hero for this uh, wonderful symposium. We thank you very much.